Okay, there's a cliche which says that my guests need no introduction, and this is actually true in this case, but I'm still going to introduce them. Uh, we have Dr. Balal from Manipal Hospitals. Uh, Manipal Hospitals, as you know, is started off in Bangalore, but they're like pioneers in the hospital space. They're expanding now a lot to the east of the country, and uh, they've set standards which are unparalleled in the, hospi in the hospital space. And I must add a word here for Dr. Balal. So the week, you know, we try a lot of things in the healthcare, try to reach out to the country, the people in the villages, people in the urban cities. And it's thanks to people like Dr. Balal and Manipal Hospitals that gives our meaning and purpose a reality. So thank you, Dr. Balal. <laughs> Earlier, we had the minister talk about uh, the fact that the way India was guided during the COVID pandemic, and the entire nation has to thank one doctor, and that is Dr. Guleria, who was the head of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. <laughs> Dr. Guleria was the head of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, is now with Midanta in Gurgaon. Uh, I still remember when we were still a bit pessimistic or apprehensive about the pandemic, the pandemic was over. I met Guleria, Dr. Guleria 18 months back in Chennai at an event, and I asked him, Dr. Guleria, is the pandemic over? And he said, based on my medical experience, India, for India is done. And I went back to Cochin on that, on that night on a flight and I didn't wear a mask. <laughs> and my third guest, of course, is Alisha Mupun. She's the managing director of uh, uh, Astor Healthcare. They are present in all the GCC countries and also in many parts of India. Alisha is also recognized by the World Economic Forum and is also part of the YPO, which I also was part of, but I did get off. So welcome, Alisha. Thanks so much. So I was just telling someone, I attended, me and my colleagues attended some uh, AI classes for journalism. At the end of it, we went in with thinking that we're gonna, the entire newsroom is going to transform. By the end of it, we just came with two learnings, which is they can translate from Hindi to English, and then you still need an editor to proofread it and then press the send button or the thing. So my question first to you, I'm going to start with a generic question and then come to a particular. Uh, generic question first to you, uh, Dr. Bilal. Uh, healthcare, do you, do you see AI saving a million lives? My distinguished panelists, Ms. Alisha Mupan, Dr. Randeep Guleria, and of course our very experienced moderator, Mr. Matthew, uh, thank you very much to the week for hosting this health summit, which I believe will have a major role to play uh, in how the healthcare of this nation is in the future. Now, you asked me a question whether AI will save a million lives. I think my answer to that will be doctors using AI will probably save millions of lives. I think anything that we innovate or do new in India, for that matter, is one is it has to be accessible which is a big issue. Second, it has to be affordable. The third is, I think, the results of AI or technology have to be superior to the conventional things. I do believe things are changing. Just to give you a quick example, we were doing uh, gallbladder surgery on my grandmother four or five decades ago. Her son was the district medical officer, so she had a suite in a government hospital. But she had a stay of one month with 12 relatives in the suite to help her out to make her comfortable. Now we do that in 24 to 48 hours. But there's still a long way to go and I think that's where technology counts. Would you fly an airline where a Boeing 747 crashes every day? Would you check into a hotel where you don't know the tariffs or it takes eight hours to check out? And that's exactly what's been happening in the healthcare. And unless we wake up and smell the coffee, we'll be left behind. So healthcare is still a long way to go and I think uh, we are going to be in the era of smart hospitals and we are blessed to be that. Certainly the hospitals of tomorrow will be very different. They would not be standard brick and mortar hospitals. They will be driven by technology and AI which will play a very major role. We have already seen that happen and it will only progress in the next few years. Right, another generic question to you Dr. Guleria. Do you see like the role of doctors changing? Uh, like I said in the morning session, even out there, uh, I said, you know, for journalists to get an exit poll wrong, life still goes on. But for doctors using AI and if something goes wrong, it's literally and metaphorically a thing of life and death. Do you see the role of doctors changing? And do you, and do you see 
the role of doctors coming down or, or being eliminated in any way? And what's the role of the doctors going to be in the future, according to you? So, um, good afternoon, everybody. And to begin with, thanks to the week for inviting me and for holding this uh, health summit. I think you raised a very important question, and that is the role of doctors in the future. When you're talking of hospitals of the future, it's also important to understand what would be the role of doctors of the future. Technology is going to come into medicine a very big, in a very, very big way, and it's going to really support how doctors are going to manage patients, whether it be AI, whether it be big data, or whether it be the internet of things, that is variable devices. But at the center of everything is the patient. And with the patient is the interaction with the patient has with the doctor. And that's why it's important to remember that medicine is both a science and an art. The art of medicine is something which is very, very important when it comes to your talking to a patient, listening to a patient, having empathy with your patients, being able to understand what the patient is not saying, but trying to convey through his body language and understand the symptoms. Because when you're treating a patient, it's not only the illness, you're treating the patient as a whole. There may be other issues which are troubling the patient, which are also causing worsening of his illness. So that, that role is very, very important for a doctor, and I don't think that will be replaced even with AI or technology coming in. But technology will help doctors in uh, doing a lot of things, and like you said, making sure that mistakes are not made, because that is very, very crucial. So when you are looking after your patients, whether it be prescribing a medication, making sure the drug interaction doesn't happen, or various other things, AI can really help in sort of a checklist to see that these things don't happen. So the, I think AIs will make medicine much better, much safer. Uh, will also do a lot of things which may be mundane in terms of day-to-day -day practice, but they will not really replace doctors. Uh, for a patient, the connect with the doctor is, I think, very, very important, and that is something that will continue to stay. Right. Just before I come to Alicia, just one quick question. You mentioned about the art and the science of it. but if you're applying the science of it, would you say that AI can eliminate, or to, or to what extent can AI eliminate mistakes, if you can quantify that, approximately? So it depends on how well the AI is developed and what you're looking for. For example, AI in radiology. We had a very nice talk on how AI can be useful in diagnosing tuberculosis. And that's being used. We have, Madanta is involved in what is known as a TB-free Haryana. We, we have now, we started off with buses, now we have motorcycles because the, you can take your equipment which is basically a portable x-ray machine which is just like a small box rather than a huge machine and your gene expert which does your sputum sampling and you can go from village to village on a motorcycle. But the x-ray can be read in a much better manner if you use the AI based technology than if you ask a human to do it and there's a lot of data to support that. So it, from a screening point of view when you have a large number of let's say x-ray or radiology data to read, it's better than the human eye in terms of picking up small mistakes and whether it be tuberculosis, whether it be a small nodule in the lung which may have implication of becoming cancer later on. AI can help that so that doctors don't make a mistake, especially if you have a busy OPD or you are burdened with a lot of uh, workload. So that's where I think AI will play a huge role, whether it be uh, radiology, whether it be pathology, when you're looking at slides and you're trying to pick up abnormal cells, the AI may be able to mark it out much better than what the human eye could do. Right. To Alicia, the obvious question, did this hospital management become easier with the AI? We had, uh, uh, we had Siddharth Bhaga talking about the doctor's letters being made easier for the patient. As a, as a woman who runs many hospitals, overlooks many hospitals in the GCC and in India, do you see AI coming in a big way, in the administrative way, in your field? Uh, thank you. Thank you, first of all, uh, Riyadh, for having me in the week. Uh, and very happy to be here with very distinguished icons in healthcare. Really interesting question, right? So um, I think we spoke about how it helps the doctors. Um, but from a patient perspective or from a management perspective that you're asking, some of the biggest pain points that patients feel when they're in the hospital, other than the quality of care, of course, is the admission process, the discharge process. I'm in the ER, I'm waiting for hours. I haven't seen the nurse, I haven't seen the doctor, the triage hasn't happened. 
So when you look at inputs like these, definitely tools like AI will help in sort of fast tracking that, that mechanism, right? What should the care journey be? Um, so, so I think those are ways which definitely will definitely improve the efficiency of the hospital and the management of the hospital because at the end of the day, it's a scarce resource, right? How many beds do we have? How many doctors do we have? So how do you most effectively and efficiently utilize the resources so that you can take care of a larger population? So these tools from AI will help us kind of improve the service, let the patient maybe come when the doctor is almost free to see. You don't want the patient to come in and uh, wait for two hours and then they're already kind of in pain and then having to wait in the hospital. So I think those are the ways where management really gets impacted and where, you know, which are, the, which are bottlenecks that you can solve for with, the, with technology, with information, with data. So, so we, we've started using those tools. One is while you're going through the journey, and two is post the journey, right? Getting those inputs, what worked, what didn't work. You're getting the large, but data is a very overused and abused term, right? It's become very cliche. I think the most important thing is how do you get meaningful insights? I think over the last four years, post-COVID, what we are finding really exciting is these models are being built to say that what's working, what's not working. And I think that's what's helping us optimize care, say that with the same hospital of my 500 beds, if I could see so much OPDs, how can I see 10% more or 20% more? And that's what we're trying to solve for here, right? How do you make sure that you're effectively utilizing the resources you have? So it will be, I think I'll be right to say that the doctors are not gonna be eliminated right now, but the administrative staff is going to be affected, right? Very likely. We could become a <laughs> scarce resource. <laughs> right. Extinct. Right. To come to more specific, you know, I was really, uh, uh, Dr. Balal, I was, I was seeing a study where in, in Brisbane in Australia, you know, where many people are exposed to the sun, and they feed the data of bas basically Caucasians, right? And then what happens is that there are many Asians and Africans who live there, and when they feed this data to the AI, or the data to, to think for the diagnosis, the generic diagnosis is for Caucasians, and so there are the wrong readings which happen for Asians or for the African community. Is, so how do we go about solving this? No, I think uh, any new thing, innovation, AI, has to be taken with a pinch of salt. You still have to use your human brains to sort out things. For instance, uh, nowadays, I'm sure Dr. Guleri would probably agree, no patient comes to me without a sheaf of Google papers with a diagnosis, management, and they start off with questioning what we have to tell them rather than what we need to find out and then tell them. So I think Google data is great. I think I use it very much for my maps. But uh, you have to take it in the right perspective. You say little swelling of the feet will come up with heart failure, cirrhosis of the liver, kidney failure, and the patient is totally baffled. So I think everything has to be taken in the perspective. The example that you gave, it's extremely common to have skin cancers in the Western world, especially Caucasians who are exposed to the sun. Hardly ever happens in the African-American population or for that matter in India. So if you give a Google thing saying that you have been in the sun and you have seen a lesion in the skin, it's definitely not going to be cancer for an Indian, but it may be cancer for the Australian. So everything has to have the right perspective. And that's why we have to have checks and balances when we use technology. Right. Dr. Guleria, I just always want to ask you this question. During the pandemic, would AI have helped in any way? Oh, yes, AI did help. We published a paper from Ames where we looked at, uh, this was a time when RT-PCR was taking very long and we didn't have the rapid antigen test and the turnaround for RT-PCR was almost 8 to 12 hours. So we looked at, and this was done with IIT Delhi, and one of our radiologists there who has done a course on artificial intelligence. We developed an app which was very, uh, a software where you could look at the chest X-ray and diagnose whether this chest X-ray was suggestive of COVID pneumonia or not. So AI-based algorithm was based, looking at X-rays which were pre-COVID. So we had a large number of X-rays which were pre-COVID, and then we had those during COVID. And based on that, you could really say that this was had a high diagnostic yield, but a good sensitivity and specificity. AI also was used in a lot of other things. Even if you look at the uh, various apps which we had, which would tell you that you had a patient who may be COVID positive around you. And you could see that on your phone. That was also using AI to some extent. And then in various other forms, even uh, looking
looking at how technology could be used. Uh, I think AI was already there, but it could have made a bigger difference if we had looked at it. And I personally feel that we as physicians are a little reluctant to accept the change in technology as, let's say, engineers have done or other, in, it has come in other areas, even for that matter in, in media in terms of uh, how AI has changed how you see movies or how you see, uh, see various entertainment programs. Physicians have been more conservative and I think we need to move out of that and we need to interact with computer engineers, scientists, mathematicians, people working in humanities and look at how we can move out of our silos and develop uh, programs which are looking at technology in a better way as far as health is concerned. Right, i just come back after asking Alicia a question back to AI and the pandemic. But Alicia, I was at a conference where it says that now, you know, and you manage all these big hospitals, there was a conference where they said that the, the time of big hospitals may be over, where you've got to move to rural areas and closer to the people with smaller, smaller hospitals. And that's when AI comes in, and that's when you're in connect with the people, whether it's urban or whether it's rural. Do you see that happening with Astor? So, Ria, um, I mean, my personal feeling on AI, or the, where I feel the biggest change is going to happen, is for primary care. You saw, I think a lot of us spoke about the shift from communicable disease to non-communicable. That's gone up from 30% to 60% in two decades. Now, what does that mean, right? If I'm a diabetic patient, if I have a hypertension, managing this care over a very long period of time, the different data points that I'm getting for young population, right? Now, people are having it at 25, 30, 35, 40. So it's not like where I need to go in for a knee surgery and it's a five-day process. So I think here, uh, now with the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, uh, with the ABA cards, the amount of information that is coming on uh, for, for a large part of the population and being able to kind of crunch that data and say that how do I look at people and how do I make sure that these people don't have to reach the hospital. So if you have a strong primary care system which is led with data model with AI, you will not have to get, otherwise what's the end uh, what's the fear with any of these comorbidities that are coming through with a non-communicable disease, right? I'm going to be ending up in a hospital sooner. Mm -hmm. But now with the information of data that we're able to collect in India with all the digital mission initiatives, we would be well placed to be the leader in the world when it comes to healthcare because no one else is going to be having this amount of volume, this amount of data, and the digital infrastructure to kind of condense that, right? So, I mean, I saw a lot of people on my table and elsewhere wearing either there's a Fitbit or there's an Aura ring. How do we collate all this information together and say that predict the unpredictable, right? How well, with my lifestyle today, how long am I likely to live? What choices can I make? that will make me better, right? I think that's where AI becomes your care partner. You have to go to a doctor when there's trauma, when you have to do the surgeries. But for all the non-communicable diseases, I need a different partner with me every single day, making sure that the, those nudges, the digital nudges come in. Yeah, that's brilliant. But another thing I want to find out, uh, there, was a, there was a guy from, I'm not going to name the firm, who said that in future, the role of a pharmacist is going to be very different. The first part I agree, and I said it's fine using AI. When the medicines run out, he calls the patient who's nearby and tells him the medicines run out, why don't you come and pick up the next slot? The second part of it is which kind of baffled me. If that medicine's not there, he using AI would suggest another medicine to help the patient. Is that true? Uh, interesting. I think uh, we haven't evolved to that stage because I think the pharmacists have... Culturally, also, we say the doctors say what needs to be prescribed. Will that shift to a point where your pharmacist becomes almost like your care physician? I, I don't know. I think, see, healthcare is so regulated, and rightfully so, right? It's life and death. Like you said, if, if you don't predict the polls, it's okay. But if you're going to give the wrong medication, that's, that could be life-threatening, right? So I, I think we have to evolve quite a bit before we get to a point where pharmacists are swapping medicines. Right. Dr. Balal, to you now, the hospitals in the future, you heard the minister talk about the government's vision, what they've done, the government's vision. You've traveled the world, you've seen hospitals in the West, you've seen hospitals in India. If you were to ask for government intervention for hospitals to move forward to the next level, what would it be for the future of hospitals? At the outset, I would like to say that India has come a long way. 
Uh, when I was growing up, our only aim in life was to go to the U.S. and settle down there. I was probably one of the first few to come back to India 30 years ago. And uh, I'm very thankful to that. Uh, this is pro uh, probably a far better life. And very honestly, the care in India now is far better than many of the Western things. I get my family to come to Manipal Hospital, Bangalore for their care either in person or using technology as telemedicine to get the consult. It's a lot better and uh, good results and we have the same infrastructure as they do and we are more accessible than they are. So, in my opinion, I think we have certainly come a long way and it is certainly comparable to any hospitals in the West. I still am a little more conventional. I think AI and the tools of innovation should be used by the doctors and they should still guide the way these tools are used for the right treatment of the patients. And uh, what we have, what we must admit is since Dr. Guleria is here, I think the greatest impetus for technology was COVID. I think uh, our telemedicine was stuck in regulatory and legal matters for decades since I came back. One week of COVID changed the entire world. All the regulations, all the judicial requirements were given and now telemedicine has become the norm. And in my opinion, uh, what you asked Alicia, whether we would move to the rural areas, I think people will not move to the rural areas even if you want to because you cannot just move a doctor or a hospital to the rural area. Infrastructure has to exist for the doctors to have a good living. No one will go to a rural area if there are no schools, no entertainment, nothing for their family to do. I think we have to focus on primary care, preventive care, which believe me, will save more lives than Asta, Manipal or Medanta put together. Just stopping diarrheal diseases will save millions of children much more than all the corporate hostels put together. So, Dr. Guleria, so having worked with AIMS and now with Medanta, which is one of the leading private hospitals, do you, what, what, do you, what do you think from the government sector, does anything need to change now that you've seen the private sector? But having said that, in all our rankings, all three hospitals, AIMS, Medanta, Manipal, and, uh, and uh, Astra have come right up there. But what do you see change, having to change from a government point of view and a private point of view, and what does the private need from the government, having worked with AIMS and now with Medanta? Okay, that's a little bit of a tough question. So I think from the government point of view, I think there needs to be an understanding that we are living through a revolution. Medicine is changing very, very dramatically. And therefore, there has to be the government and the investment has to be in tune with that. Often what happens is that it takes a longer time because of red tapeism and so many other things for technology to come into the government sector. Uh, it comes much more rapidly in the private sector. This was not what, it, what was there 30, 40 years ago when you had very little private sectors, you had more of government hospitals and there was a lot of technology coming into the government hospitals. But now technology is changing so rapidly but unless you do that, you will not be there in, in terms of doing cutting-edge treatment or cutting-edge research. So I think the government needs to invest more in, in healthcare, look at how they can also move forward in an aggressive manner. Uh, the private sector, of course, needs to see how they can partner with the government sector in terms of providing healthcare in a more holistic fashion. There are certain areas and certain programs which I think can be done only by the government sector. When you talk of preventive health, a lot of investment needs to come from the government sector in terms of preventive health programs. But the private sector can partner with the government to do that. And that, I think, is where the future lies. Because as has already been mentioned, we are moved, the burden of disease now has moved from communicable to non-communicable diseases. Uh, India has now a huge burden of non-communicable disease. And these are diseases which are chronic. If you have a non-communicable disease, you are going to have it for life. If you had a communicable disease, you had malaria, you, you took treatment and the patient could be lost to follow up, that didn't matter. But if you have heart disease, if you have diabetes, hypertension, you have to be followed up on a regular basis to see that these, this is under control, you are not developing end organ damage, you are not developing complications. And therefore, there needs to be the use of technology both in the government and the private sector to see how we can make sure that the patient is followed regularly, is treated in a proper manner. And I think that is where we must really have a big thrust. Yes, I know we have got a short of time, but there are two questions left. Uh, two, many more questions left, but because of the paucity of time, there's us two. Alicia, to you, because we have a lot of Indians in the Middle East, 
and uh, you see a lot of it, the hospitals in the Middle East, your hospitals in the Middle East. How would you compare the infrastructure or the, uh, the availability of doctors at a time of need? Uh, because I know in the US it takes, if you get, even if you have an epilepsy problem, you get an attack of epilepsy, your appointment can be five days later, right? It's a, it's a horrible thing, but why we try to ape the West? What's your learning being in the Middle East and what's happening in India? So I think when you compare, when you look at the Middle East, you're right, a lot, large part of the doctor population um, are coming from India and the Indian subcontinent. Um, having said that, uh, maybe five years ago, before COVID, people would actually travel back to their home countries for most of the care, especially when it's elective, uh, cardiac, oncology, transplants, all of it. I think what's happened with COVID is everyone's realized that going ab always going abroad is not an option, and they had to kind of start utilizing the infrastructure that was available. And I think that helps, right? At the end of the day, you need the volume of cases to come in for the doctors to continue to stay skilled. So when I look at uh, uh, the GCC, what I really like is definitely the universal health insurance, which is available. It's fully insured. People have choices to go to different place. Accessibility is there because of affordability. Uh, when you look at India, what I love is the frugal innovation that was there, right? Twelve years ago, when we built our flagship in Cochin, the Aston Med City, we had uh, the, the, the Da Vinci robot that we invested in, which was like one of the few in India at that time. You know, you fast forward 10 years, we might have 10 in the system. But, you know, it went from Da Vinci, Da Vinci XI, and now we've got the SSI mantra. You know, at a fraction of the cost, India made, you know, made in India, so proud that we're able to kind of scale up. Otherwise, it was, you know, it was about having a white elephant in one place, which only a urologist would use. But now, we're able to get so many departments to come in and use it for so many different use cases, right? And I think that is going to be the lesson from India to the world always, right? How do you make healthcare more affordable? It's, it's easy when you're in a small population in, UA, in GCC where they are able to, the government might be able to fund, you've got the private entities coming in. But I think we're solving for a much larger issue for the world at large with what's happening in India. So it's very exciting to see this. Excellent. Last two questions. Uh, Mr. Balal, I mean, I go, Dr. Balal, as like I said, you know, the first pandemic, it took everybody by surprise. Are, we re are the hospitals, doctors, ready for another pandemic? Uh, we would never want another pandemic, but I think, uh, to be honest, we are a lot better now as compared to the first pandemic. I think uh, that hit us out of the blue, and no one knew anything about the pandemic. Not only us, but the entire planet didn't know what was happening. I think we are a lot more prepared now, I think both in predicting the pandemic, managing the pandemic, and also getting over the pandemic. I think a lot of things that we learned is one is being able to predict a pandemic and that's where the government really has to work very hard. The second thing is I don't think we need to rush to the hospitals for many illnesses. In my opinion, inpatient care in the hospital should be reserved for emergencies, ICUs and surgical procedures. Everything else can be managed at home on an outpatient basis or an ambulatory basis and that's what we learned in the pandemic. Initially, no hospital beds were available, but as we got to know the disease better, I think monitoring at home, use of artificial uh, device, devices to monitor your uh, parameters at home, like my watch. If I were in the COVID era, I would have pressed this button and shown it to Dr. Guleria. My oxygenation is 96%. So I didn't have to go to the hospital. My heart rate is 80 or whatever. So I think we have learned a lot from the pandemic, and I think we are far better prepared, but I think still, we would not want another pandemic, but that's not in our hands. Yeah, you did mention about flooding, of flooding, like getting to the hospital for no rhyme or reason. That's what happened in Singapore, which may face a major threat. But my last question to you, Mr. Guler Dr. Guleria, having managed the pandemic, been it in the midst of everything, do you think AI can predict another pandemic or gauge another pandemic if it has to come? God forbid. So I think we will have, so for AI, you need to have the data which has to be fed into AI to be, revealed, to be able to really predict things to happen. And one of the lessons that we've learned, I, that I feel we've learned from the previous pandemic is to prevent subsequent pandemic, we need to have very good surveillance data. Not only local surveillance data, but even at an international level. If you were able to have surveillance data at a local level, at an international level, which picks up something abnormal in terms of a cluster of cases or a cluster of disease activity which is not common. 
I think then with the use of AI, you could be able to predict how is it going to spread, how is it going to pan out and what containment measures can one take to really prevent it from becoming a pandemic and uh, sort of localizing it. Even if you look back at the COVID-19 pandemic, the outbreak happened in Wuhan in China. Had we had a good surveillance system and had there been openness in terms of the data, we could have limited it only to that area. But that did not happen. People traveled all the way to Europe, to Italy, and then the outbreak started happening in Europe and then it spread all over the world. So if we use a good surveillance system and have that data fed into an AI-based logarithm, I think it would help us to predict. But for an AI to be effective, the data has to be authentic and there has to be a good amount of data. And I think that is what we need to do if we need to predict any uh, future pandemic. And I think we need to be ready for that. This century, the last 24 years, has been a century of outbreaks and pandemics. We've had two out pandemics in this century, the H1N1 pandemic, the swine flu pandemic, and the COVID-19 pandemic. We've had innumerable outbreaks, SARS, MERS, Zika virus outbreak. So the message that we've seen in the last 24 years is that the world is becoming a small village. We travel so much, we carry viruses with us. Viruses are jumping species. All of these pandemics are zoonotic in origin. They're viruses which were in animals or in birds and they jump species, evolve to become human viruses and develop the ability to have human to human spread. So a novel virus with a capacity for human to human spread will always lead to a pandemic. And because of multiple factors, I think this is going to happen in the near future also. A scary way to end the discussion, but anyway, uh, I, th I don't think you can ask for a better set of panelists. So a big round of applause for the three panelists. Thank you, Dr. Balal. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much.